freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. Before we get into today's candid conversation, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things going on in the free speech world right now. I already mentioned our May 8th free speech crisis debate at the Comedy Cellar. But in addition to that, I wanted to note that on March 29th, our guest on the last episode, Lee Levine, won a big $2 million fees award in a defamation case filed by billionaire casino mogul Sheldon Edelson against the National Jewish Democratic Council. And obviously, in that case, Lee represented the Democratic Council and won. Now, while this cool two mil might seem like a drop in the bucket for the billionaire Adelson, it's an important judgment nonetheless because the award comes as the result of Nevada's anti-slap statute, which entitles the Democratic Council to money. So in the future, those seeking to silence speakers through frivolous defamation suits, for example, at least in Nevada, they should be warned. If you lose, it ain't going to be cheap. And our guest on today's episode, Laura Hanman, she'll talk a little bit more about this and the significance of Lee's anti-slap win. So what else do we have going on? Well, on uh, April 11th, Donald Trump signed the controversial FOSTA-SESTA bill into law. And as the bill's acronyms spell out, the bill was ostensibly written to fight online sex trafficking and to stop enabling sex traffickers. But worryingly for free speech advocates is that the new law amends Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which protects online platforms from liability as a result of some of the speech by their users on their platforms. Uh, Previous to the signing of this bill into law, only federal criminal law, intellectual property laws, and the Electronic Communications Privacy Act fell outside of Section 230's protections. It's hard to overstate, though, how important Section 230 has been for the development of the internet. It's been called the Magna Carta of the internet. And we talked a little bit about this in a past podcast episode with attorney Bob Corn Revere. But without Section 230, for example, it's doubtful that social media would exist in its current form because online platforms, they would be responsible for everything their users say using the platforms. And the liability would just present too much risk and be overly burdensome, especially from startups operating on a shoestring budget. Now, with SESTA-FOSTA, Section 230, which many in the internet and free speech communities thought was untouchable since it was passed in 1996, it's now become touchable. The Magna Carta of the internet has been compromised. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, our good friends over at EFF, they tweeted out that it was a dark day for the internet when the Senate passed the bill. And already we're seeing content that has nothing to do with facilitating sex trafficking or prostitution, and that is only tangentially related to sex, being taken down from the open internet. And this is something free speech advocates predicted would happen, if only as a result of internet companies exercising an abundance of caution. FIRE, EFF, the Center for Democracy and Technology, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, and many other free speech and open internet organizations opposed the bill as it was winding its way through Congress. But unfortunately, it wasn't enough, and uh, only time will tell how widespread the damage will be. We'll see. But finally, before we uh, get on to today's guest, I want to end this housekeeping section with a more positive note. I talk a lot about John Stuart Mill on this podcast because, to my mind, he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, free speech philosophers ever. And much of his free speech philosophy comes from his 1859 book on liberty. Now, last week, our friends over at Heterodox Academy, who, as you all know, do viewpoint diversity work on campuses, they released a brilliant, abridged, illustrated version of Chapter 2 of On Liberty, which is the chapter in that book that contains most of Mill's arguments in favor of free speech. The editors did a fantastic job with the book, I must say. The book is titled All Minus One. Uh, The title comes from a mill quote in the book, and they reduced chapter two by about 50% to remove repetitions and obscure historical references. So now it's super approachable and easily digestible for anyone looking to get the core of Mill's arguments. And the illustrations, you know, like I said, this is an illustrated version. 
of chapter two. The illustrations are brilliant. I'm not a huge graphic novel guy, but I must say they are on par with some of the graphic novels I've read. And uh, I, you know, I've read a couple. I've read Mouse. I've read V for Vendetta. Some of the big ones. This it's great. If so, if you're not interested in Mill's writings, <laughs> maybe you'd be interested in the illustrations. Anyway, you can find all minus one at heterodoxacademy.com/mill, and they have a free PDF version available, and you can download it as well from Amazon Kindle for your digital device. I don't know how well the illustrations will pop in digital, but. Uh, again, you can get a free PDF version, and I hope some of the professors who listen to this podcast will uh, perhaps consider assigning it as reading in class. We know how important Mill's arguments are to the freedom of speech. We make them a lot on this podcast. It'd be great to get them in front of more people, and Heterodox Academy certainly is doing their best to do so. So check it out. Our guest today is Laura Hanman. She is a partner and co-chair of appellate practice at Davis Wright Tremaine. And to say she's an experienced First Amendment litigator would be an understatement. She's been doing this for 30 years, and she's been focusing on defamation, news gathering, privacy, right of publicity, and reporters' privilege. Uh, she's been focusing on much more, of course, but uh, those are where her focuses lie, according to her bio on Davis Wright Tremaine's website. Her clients include Amazon, Microsoft, Dow Jones, The Economist, HarperCollins, Atlantic Media, Bloomberg and many other companies of which I'm confident most of you would be familiar. So she's big time. And I was really looking forward to speaking with Laura. We met at Davis Wright Tremaine's Washington, D.C. office. We met on April 2nd. And we talked mostly about press freedoms, but also a little bit about defamation and her work in that space. It's a really interesting conversation. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot from Laura, and I hope you do too. So without further ado, let's get on to it. On my last podcast, I spoke with Lee Levine, who mm-hmm. you, you may know through First very, Amendment very well. circles here in Washington, D.C., uh, and we spoke about defamation, and I want to talk with you mainly about press freedom issues, but I'd also like to piggyback on that last episode because mm-hmm. we talked about how foreign libel judgments cannot be enforced in the United States now because Congress passed a law, the Speech Act, but before that, you were involved in getting a court for the first time to refuse to enforce a foreign liable judgment in the United States. How did that come about? When was that? Well, the decision was, believe it or not, 1992, which seems like ancient history. Uh, And it was a small news operation based in New York called India Abroad. Are they still around? Uh, That's a good question. Um, (laughs) uh, And uh, they focused primarily, and they provided wire service to India. They did have a publication primarily for uh, Indian expats. and it did have some circulation in the UK. They wrote a story about uh, uh, the plaintiff, Mr. Bachan, uh, uh, who was close to the Prime Minister of India at the time, and uh, the Swiss were looking at various sales of a Swedish arms manufacturer and and possible improper payment to the India. Indian government, yeah. and uh, the leading Swedish newspaper, sort of the New York Times of Sweden, had reported on that, and India Abroad, based on the reports in the Swedish paper, uh, made a report. And both the Swedish paper and India Abroad were sued in the UK, uh, and uh, the Swedish paper ended up apologizing, and uh, but in the India Abroad defaulted, and they came to enforce a forty thousand pound judgment plus attorneys' fees in New York Supreme Court, the New York Trial Court in New York, and. Uh, at that point in time, there already was on a law, a law about enforcing foreign judgments, and it said if it's repugnant to our public policy, uh, courts may choose not to enforce, but they should obviously, there is uh, a deference paid to foreign judgments generally, so you have to find a good reason not to enforce it. And what uh, the judge in New York said was, it is true that England and the United States share many common law principles of law. Nevertheless, a significant difference between the two jurisdictions lies in England's lack of an equivalent to the First Amendment. 
the protection to free speech and the press embodied in the First Amendment would be seriously jeopardized by the entry of foreign libel judgments granted pursuant to standards deemed appropriate in England, but considered antithetical to the protections afforded the press by the U.S. Constitution. Wow. And so she refused to enforce that judgment. Uh, the Maryland Supreme Court uh, came out a similar way in a case involving um, uh, t- uh, publication in the Daily Telegraph. Was uh, that after this 92 yes, case? Yes, uh-huh. uh, th- that was uh, the Matusevich case, which was in 1997. Actually, it was in the D.C. federal court, and it, when it got to the D.C. circuit, they certified the question to the Maryland Court of uh, Supreme, uh, highest court in Maryland, uh, which ruled and said it was unenforceable. So, was this a problem before '92 that you had judges here in the United States enforcing foreign libel judgments? Well, I mean, what was here? It, there was some of that. What was the primary but, problem back then was libel tourism, which is where because the British law was so favorable to the plaintiff, uh, American celebrities. Uh, Russian oligarchs, uh, uh, Middle Eastern financiers of allegedly terrorist activities, uh, all chose London uh, and Ireland as a choice of uh, place to sue. And that was a growing problem at that time. But is it still a problem? So on a previous podcast I did, I think this was back in 2016, I interviewed Deborah Lipstadt, Mm -hmm. who's a professor at Emory, who wrote a book about Holocaust denialism in which she accused David Irving, I think quite rightly, of being a Holocaust denier. Mm -hmm. And David Irving sued her uh, for libel in the the UK, and she eventually won. But there was a weird quirk, of course, in that case, the, the burden is on the uh, defendant to prove the truth right. to the statement. Mm-hmm. So she had essentially had to prove the truth mm-hmm. of the Holocaust. But I was talking to Lee Levine on my last podcast uh, about this case, and he said they've sort of reformed the laws in the United Kingdom since then. So now in some ways, it's more of an uphill battle to win a defamation claim in the UK, and you don't have as much uh, shopping around to to f- you know find the right forum to win if you're a plaintiff. He said in, in some cases it's easier to get a case dismissed in England. Has that been your experience as of late? Well, there's no question that after uh, the Bachan case and then of course after 9/11, uh, the speech once the Speech Act was passed in 2010 and it was passed unanimously. Uh, I testified in the House of Representatives, uh, which made it law, basically, what the Bachan court had held, that uh, U.S. courts will not enforce foreign libel judgments, not just the U.K., but foreign libel judgments, if they are not consistent with the protections of the First Amendment. And after that, we saw a huge decline in libel tourism, and it also led uh, the British, they said they were shamed by the American action, that literally were some of the parliamentarians' comments, and they passed the Defamation Reform Act, to which you just referred. When did that pass? Do you remember? Uh, soon after the Speech okay. Act. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, and that had a number of helpful reforms. Uh, one was to discourage this kind of forum shopping of libel tourism so that if uh, it wasn't um, primarily uh, circulated in the UK, you know, the case should not be brought there. It codified what had been uh, a growing legal principle in British law that had a fault standard, you know, in, in the, one of the great uh, inventions of our First Amendment as interpreted in New York Times v. Sullivan is even if you make a mistake and get it wrong, if you didn't do so with some level of fault, depending on or malice, it, it'd be actual malice, which is knowledge of falsity or serious doubts as to the truth if it was a public figure, such as Mr. Bachan, I should say, Mr. Bachan not only was close to the prime minister, but his brother was the leading Bollywood star. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a very, very prominent family. Um, uh, so Britain uh, approached th- not as strong as our protections on fault, but something similar to that. But they still had the burden of proof on 
on truth or falsity, uh, still here in the U.S., if it's a matter of public concern, the plaintiff has to prove truth. Uh, and uh, in in the U.K., I mean, the, the defendant has to prove truth in the U.K. The plaintiff here has to prove falsity. And I'll give you my example of that. Uh, and it's fairly recent. Uh, Sheldon Adelson, who is a leading owner of casinos in the world, uh, sued a Wall Street Journal reporter who was based in Hong Kong and covered his casinos in Macau. And she was reporting on a lawsuit between Mr. Adelson and the, the former head of his Macau casinos who he had fired. And she was giving a little bit of color. And in her article, she said that Mr. Adelson was a scrappy, foul-mouthed billionaire from working-class Dorchester. And he sued her, not the journal, in Hong Kong for saying he was foul-mouthed. Now, had that case been brought in the U.S., it would have been dismissed as opinion or not defamatory um, in context. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, and he would have had the burden of proving that he was not foul-mouthed. But because it was brought in Hong Kong, we had the burden of proving he was foul-mouthed. And so we had to take depositions under U.S. statutes for use in uh, for, uh, taking discovery here for use in foreign proceedings. We had to take the deposition of his former chauffeur. Uh, I took the deposition of a rabbi. Um, and um, the discovery must have been quite robust. <laughs> quite robust, and but uh, we were fought at every turn because you have to get permission from the federal court. We won in the Second Circuit, the Third Circuit, the Eleventh Circuit on the right to take these depositions. Um, so it was a very costly affair. It ended with Mr. Adelson dropping the lawsuit. The article is still up as written. No money changed hands. Um, and But that's a stark example. And Hong Kong has not adopted the Defamation Reform Act. So we were still under, but even under the Defamation Reform Act, that burden of proof uh, still um, rests with the defendant to prove truth under Hong Kong law and British law. So are, are a lot of libel tourists going to Hong Kong now? Or is have, it not as attractive because it's not a primarily English-speaking uh, well, I, I have not seen that trend, you know, um, honestly, uh, but I have definitely seen a decrease in libel tourism. Unfortunately, the Speech Act did not cover privacy, which is a growing claim in the UK and Europe in general. And so that is uh, something that remains to be done. But I will say um, uh, that just last month, uh, the Bachan case was applied uh, to by a court to refuse to enforce to recognize, in essence, uh, a order from the a British court that said that everything in that case had to be. Uh, under seal and not public and even is just uh, listed as anonymous. You don't know who the parties are. And when a suit was brought here in the U.S. Uh, and the the defendant said everything had to be filed under seal because of this British order, the court citing Bachan refused to uh, recognize the British order sealing it and applied U.S. principles which have a presumption yeah. of openness in courts. So the scope of Bachan Sean is, is is expanding outside of defamation at this point to open records to perhaps privacy. Yes. Or at least that's the hope. That's that's the hope. Um, but as a result of Bachan, when I'm introduced to judges in the UK, a colleague of mine says, "This is the woman that had our law declared repugnant." <laughs> I want to pivot now because uh, I was talking with Ron Collins, who's a great friend of, of Fires, and he, he's the one who originally recommended that I speak with you in, uh, primarily about free press issues. And we have a president right now who's, who seems to stand in opposition to a lot of uh, 
news reporting. I think he had a tweet this morning that went after NBC uh, and someone else. It's hard to keep track. But anyway, his, his former chief strategist, as you know, Steve Bannon, called the media the opposition party. In your work with media clients or other clients who, who do news reporting, how have you seen this perceived hostility manifest itself, if at all? Is it a lot of bluster? Is it a lot of bark and not a lot of bite? Or has it been uh, more than that? Have we seen concerted efforts from this administration to uh, punish media institutions for their news reporting or make that reporting much more difficult? Well, um, as I think has been widely said, uh, even the president doesn't control the Constitution. Um, so, uh, it you know, a full-scale repeal of many of the protections seems uh, unlikely. I mean, Congress can't even amend the Constitution without going through a large procedure. Where he will have impact is he's appointing many federal judges, and the federal judges interpret the Constitution, of course, at the highest level. I'm happy to say that um, I think the First Amendment is one of the most bipartisan issues uh, that there is, and I don't necessarily believe the conservative judges will uh, pull back on First Amendment protections. I won a case in the D.C. Circuit uh, just uh, last year uh, that w the decision was authored by Judge Kavanaugh, who by most reports is a leading contender for the Supreme Court if there is a vacancy in the Trump administration. And he wrote a very strong opinion uh, upholding the actual malice, application of the actual malice standard to what was clearly an unintended mistake uh, that was made by a publication. Yeah, I was actually talking with Lee about this because he said, you know, the one place that the president can influence this protectiveness of our First Amendment is in the appointment of federal judges. But then the question is, well, is he is that one of his main considerations when he's appointing these judges? How much does he actually think about this? When you look at the reports about how much the Federalist Society ha it has uh, with regards to influence and what judges get selected, uh, they're pretty good on the First Amendment, or at least in my experience. So I, I have a hard time envisioning they'd recommend a judge who would like to ro roll back some of the uh, case law on defamation or any, any of the other robust First Amendment protections we have. I think that's true. Um, and, uh, you know, nonetheless, I would say the climate is, mm -hmm. you know, it, Folks have been against the press or, or feel queasy about the press for a long time, and I think the internet has made it, you know, that much more pervasive. Um, and whether the Gawker case was a canary in the coal mine or not, you know, and it wasn't a libel case, it was a privacy case. But in that case, as you know, uh, Hulk Hogan won a one point. The uh, $130 million. Put Gawker out of business. Put Gawker out of business. And so I think that has, to some extent, encouraged libel suits. Uh, in the past, people have known that it's a very high bar that they will have to meet in order to survive even a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment. This has given some... Uh, impetus to would be plaintiff lawyers, and of course, in that case, there was a behind the scenes financier of it who strategized in, in such Thiel. a way <laughs> that uh, you know the claims would not be insured and that would result in bankruptcy. And if that were to become a trend, um, you know, that would be, I think, a, a scary thing as well. And but the Gawker case, that wasn't a libel case, right? No. That was an invasion of privacy Correct. case. But you think the principles that were applied there could affect? It's not the principles. It's really just ginormous judgment um, yeah. and, and and reflecting uh, real hostility toward the press, at least toward Gawker. Um, and, uh, you know, how does that sort of manifest in, in various ways and encourage others to bring libel suits? So I think, you know, it, it happens to also coincide with, you know, the election of a president who, you know, as you say, tweets almost every day against the press. Um, and against the fake news media. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, um, but it, it's not just, you know, gigantic judgments, as was the case in, in Gawker. I mean, we're even thinking, looking at 
how the president tweets about institutions like Amazon, who I also recognize as a client of yours, and what that can do just to the stock market for the stock, the, the, the holding companies that own some of these institutions, um, you know, th that has an effect too. Well, and, you know, I, I won't weigh in on the merits or lack of merit of the various assertions about the Postal Service and taxes. Uh, or the, how the Washington Post should be registered as a lobbyist or something. I mean, uh, the one thing I will say is, and I do represent the Washington Post as well as Amazon, and I see no... Uh, involvement of Mr. Bezos in the editorial content of the Washington Post. He's made it very, very clear that he's not involved, and my experience is, confirms that. And the Washington Post has one of the most highly regarded editors uh, currently in any newspaper. Um, if you see the movie Spotlight, you know why. Yep, that's Marty him. Barron. And he would not tolerate any such interference. So uh, it's very clear to me that there's a complete separation between church and state, uh, and the two businesses have not, A, Mr. Bezos is not involved in the editorial content, and B, it's totally separate from uh, his work at Amazon. Uh, does, uh, to the extent any of these legislative or suggested initiatives are based on content, on what CNN is saying, what Washington Post is saying it would violate the First Amendment to take these actions uh, that whether it's an antitrust action as CNN is yeah. currently facing. I was going to um, mention that. Uh, or these um, suggestions about Amazon, if it's in order to punish speech or is based on speech, that would be unconstitutional. Uh, and, and, you know, in its shades of the Nixon era where there were threats to the Washington Post about TV stations they owned and uh, during uh, the wa white, uh, Watergate period. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into litigation strategy too much, but how would you prove that an antitrust action was content-based? Well, I, I haven't followed that closely, the yeah. CNN, but I think they're, they're trying to get that discovery, and, and they're on trial now. Okay. And I think some of the effort is to find, see if there was any direct efforts, you know, but you don't even have to be direct. If the president's tweeting, um, you know, I think people, you know, get the message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of the Washington Post, your colleagues, you mentioned in your L.A. office in an email to me, got documents in the Trump University class action lawsuit. Um, you got They got them unsealed before the election. Previously, they had been sealed. How did, how did that come about? And uh, is it typical for cases like that to remain under seal? Well, as you know, uh, during the litigation process, it's fairly, this was a class action suit against Trump University, alleging that they had engaged in deceptive practices to get people to enroll in their courses that, you know, said that they would, you know, become wealthy and learn how to be like Donald Trump. And, become real estate tycoons. Um, and... Uh, there were documents that had been exchanged by the parties in the course of discovery, and it is very typical that those will be subject to what's called a protective order so that the parties can't go about and distribute them widely or post them on the Internet or whatever, what are sensitive, you know, uh, proprietary information. But when those documents get filed in a lawsuit, uh, that is in the public record, then uh, and and they s typically will say we want them under seal. It's up to the court to see whether the presumption of access has been overcome, and whether those documents should be filed under seal. Just because they may be subject to a protective order when the parties are exchanging them in discovery, doesn't automatically mean that they get filed under seal and stay under seal uh, in the court case because of that presumption. And here, where there was a serious allegations of uh, deceptive business practices, where 
uh, the can- then candidate Trump was running uh, largely on his business record as one of his qualifications to be president. Uh, it was very much in the public interest to see what those documents included, such as a playbook telling marketeers how to market uh, the Trump University services. Um, And so we moved uh, to unseal those documents. And Judge Coriel, who, uh, as you know, that day, Mr. Trump uh, railed against his the fact that he was Mexican and therefore biased, that was the very day that he ruled to unseal these documents, um, saying it was a matter of public interest and that because at that point Trump University was not operating, it wasn't clear that it would affect any future business activity, so there was no trade secret or or strong proprietary interest in these documents, particularly since it wasn't clear they would resume operation. And of course, a year ago, uh, this case was settled for $25 million. Was the case, was the lawsuit brought before Trump was a candidate? Or was, for example, were these documents placed under seal while he was running for office? I don't remember exactly the timing. I mean, the lawsuit had certainly pre-existed as my recollection, his running for office. Uh, I don't remember exactly when these documents were filed in the case. Um, Okay. Speaking of public record requests or Freedom of Information Act requests we're talking about, the federal government, um, these can be powerful tools for reporters to shed light on the actions of public officials. And recently I was reading a story that I wanted to ask someone who works on public records cases about. I was reading a story about a news outlet in Oregon that filed a public records request for records pertaining to a conversation between the University of Oregon president and an editor at the New York Times. And this was really the first case where I, I saw that there might be a tension between the the public, the access to public records that journalists want and also the freedom of the press, because in this case, you are turning over private correspondences between a journalist doing his or her reporting and a public official. So do you see any tensions there? Is there any way that states or the federal government have tried to mediate the concerns that might exist on both sides? Uh, I mean, that's a a very, very good question. Um, I mean, in that, there is definitely, uh, as you know, if there's a subpoena for those records, um, the New York Times could assert a journalist's privilege, which um, in this case, there was no confidential source relationship. No. Um, and so uh, it would be a qualified privilege if it was even a news gathering. As I recall, it was something about an op-ed. Or- yeah, it was, it was a background in an op-ed, but you know the, the principles right. remain, and it's just a curious case. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, because it's a freedom of information request coming from a news organization, because the professor, the president was of a state uh, university, so therefore subject to f- public records requests. You know, typically if it was a private university, uh, that would not be subject to a public records request. But because it was a state university, it was. Um, I think if it had been... Uh, you know, a deep confidential source relationship with the Times maybe have intervened, maybe, um, to prevent it. Um, but it is a, an ironic twist yeah. here. Have um, you seen anything like that before? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I know we're going to get to national security. Yes. Um, and uh, that's, you know, the case I've been thinking about in that context uh, most recently that I was involved in in that was um, a, uh, an investigation into General Cartwright, who was a four-star general, uh, advised uh, the Obama administration, and there was an investigation into whether uh, he had been involved at all in a leak about um, uh, this virus uh, that was um, sent uh, to try and... Um, hurt the Iranian nuclear gotcha. process. Um, and Stetsnet um, is the virus. And in that case, um, they did, and whether he had talked to journalists. 
uh, particularly my client, uh, who was at Newsweek at the time and a New York Times reporter. And uh, they did not seek the uh, emails of the Times or, or my client, but they got the email, the Gmail of General Cartwright. Mm. And uh, so when they interviewed him, the FBI interviewed him for, um, in connection with this investigation, uh, he did not have counsel. And he said, oh, I haven't communicated with any journalist. Um, and then they presented to him his Gmail. He ultimately pled guilty to lying to the FBI Um and in that case, uh, both m- my client and, and the Times reporter sent letters sort of giving the context that he wasn't the original source, that they were trying to, um, s- you know, to some extent confirm and to some extent learn whether there was sensitive information or, you know, and, uh, and put a context to the whole thing. And President Obama, three days before he left office, um, pardoned General Cartwright. Um, uh, But that is both an example of what is the sort of back and forth between journalists and national security people. Um, But it also is an example of where you go to Google to get the Gmail, you don't go to the journalist, uh, much as you're describing, you go through FOIA to get the email, um, not uh, to the New York Times in the case of the president of Oregon. So you brought up President Obama. We've talked about Trump already, and at least with President Obama during his tenure, Amongst journalists I've spoken with, they've said he's he's not been a great friend of the press, uh, and especially when it comes to confidential sources and, and to whistleblowers. Uh, James Risen, who I believe was one of your clients, or maybe still is one of your clients, was famously subpoenaed by both the Bush and Obama administrations, I believe, for Correct. for one of his sources. He wrote in a New York Times op-ed that criticism of Mr. Obama's stance on press freedom, government transparency, and secrecy is hotly debated by the White House. But many journalism groups say the record is clear. Over the past eight years, the administration has prosecuted nine cases involving whistleblowers and leakers, compared with only three by all previous administrations combined. It has repeatedly used the Espionage Act, a relic of World War I-era red-baiting, not to prosecute spies, but to go after government officials who talk to journalists. Under Mr. Obama, the Department of Justice and the FBI have spied on reporters by monitoring their phone records, labeled one journalist an unindicted co-conspirator in a criminal case for simply doing reporting, and issued subpoenas to other reporters to try to force them to reveal their sources and testify in criminal cases. So what do you make of the Obama administration's track record on free press issues. There seems to be at least some, even some tension in his mind where we have to go after these whistleblowers, but they obviously did some good because I'm pardoning them. Well, uh, all presidents, um, the current occupant included, uh, hate leaks. That is a given. I think what has changed somewhat, and it was most evident in the Obama years, was the ability to find out who are the leakers, not from necessarily the journalists, but from following the electronic trail in one way or another, or the cell phone trail. Uh, And it is, so that has, in the past, While presidents hated leakers, they knew it was a futile effort because they weren't going to be able to force the journalists to disclose. Um, But now they had a way to do it without asking the journalists. So, for example, in the Thomas Drake case, which was a guy at the NSA who was prosecuted under the Espionage Act, an example of overreach, I represented the journalists that Uh, was allegedly involved. And they never subpoenaed her. They never had to subpoena her. They followed what he had downloaded over the NSA. They raided his home. He talked to them, again, without counsel. Um, Never a good idea. (laughs) uh, And uh, they could make their case. What ended up happening, however, in that case, was the judge pushed back and said, 
because uh, many of these things weren't really properly classified and various other things. And set, he ended up pleading guilty to a misdemeanor and never serving any time. And the judge reprimanding the Obama administration for overcharging him with these espionage violations. And he's, you know, he went from being a high level NSA official to working in the Apple store in Bethesda. Mm. Um, and and is also very much uh, prominent in talking about these these issues. And of course, Jim Risen uh, lived with the sword of Damocles over his head. Uh, the Obama administration, first the Bush administration, the Obama administration subpoenaed him about a confidential source, alleged confidential source who was on trial. Um, and ulti- the uh, trial judge had quashed the subpoena, saying, you have a lot of other material. You don't really have the critical necessity for him, which is the standard that's supposed to be applied. And the Obama administration took it all the way to the Fourth Circuit to get declared that the uh, there's no federal protection for um, in, in a federal leak investigation or prosecution. There's no federal basis for a shield law, um, neither federal common law nor a First Amendment com- uh, requirement, and cert was sought and cert was denied. So the Fourth Circuit, at least, has said there isn't a federal basis. There's state law shield laws that protect you in, say, a libel case or a criminal prosecution under state law, but for a federal leak investigation, the law is mixed, um, and you know that Judy Miller uh, went to prison because she wouldn't disclose her confidential source, uh, and that was a leak investigation involving uh, Scooter Libby, um, and uh, she... And in that case, uh, one judge on the D.C. Circuit argued strongly for a federal common law privilege, uh, much like attorney-client privilege or uh, priest-confessional privilege um, and priest-penitent privilege. Um, But that is still, you know, in flux, I would say, um, in the courts. And Jim Risen said he was ready to go to jail before he would turn over his confidential source. Yeah. Definitely. But he lived with this, uh, you know, hanging over his head for many years. They ultimately didn't call him because just as Judge Brinkema, the trial judge, had said, they didn't really need him. Mm -hmm. What typically happens when the federal government approaches a news institution or media company about national security concerns stemming from a yet to be published story or the way they handle their, um, their uh, products, if you're talking about Amazon or another one of these tech companies. Is there a discussion with the government? Uh, is it confrontational? Does the government usually take these concerns on behalf of the, the press institutions or the tech companies seriously? What's it like to be a fly on the wall in those conversations? Well, there are two different things. Uh, one is um, if the government, federal government, is thinking of subpoenaing records either from a Microsoft or uh, or is, is thinking of subpoenaing the reporters. And in the Obama administration, when there were some instances of going after basically press records through third-party providers. Um, the Attorney General Holder adopted new guidelines on when uh, and what uh, a U.S. attorney or a, a DOJ lawyer has to do if he's going to subpoena records that involve the press. So when you say a third party, you mean if a reporter uses, for example, a Google or Microsoft product in the course of their reporting, they won't go after the New York Times, say, but they might ask Verizon right. for phone records. And now, under the Attorney General guidelines that were implemented by Holder, and which many press groups, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, among others, uh, were very involved in talking through with DOJ, and they adopted guidelines that basically say that absent, you know, supreme, extreme national security reasons, you're supposed to talk to the news organization first and try and, and, and show that, that you absolutely need these records and have a discussion and give then the press organization an opportunity to move to quash these, these uh, subpoenas. Um, and 
the thing that, you know, got everyone concerned is when uh, Attorney General Sessions said, I think in uh, August or September, that they were going to be reviewing those Attorney General guidelines. So far, as far as I know, there's not been a change to them. Um, but that is obviously a concern. And I will say also, I participated with the team on behalf of Microsoft uh, challenging uh, the orders that the government gets when they get a search warrant. Uh, they typically get an order saying you're not, Microsoft is not allowed to disclose to the customer, be it a press person or you or anybody, uh, that you've gotten this order. Um, uh, to you've gotten a search warrant for your emails, um, and it's a non-disclosure order. And Microsoft challenged the fact that these orders are very often without any time limit. They just you know go on forever, uh, and they're without specific factual showings. They're they're sort of categories of information that they're supposed to tick off, but they haven't made specific factual showings. And we brought a a challenge to that, and uh, we survived a motion to dismiss. And then, and the in the sessions era, they actually have changed their instructions to uh, federal lawyer and prosecutors that they should have a time limit, you know, a, a presumptive one year time limit, and then have to go back to justify it. Um, and so, there's actually been progress on that front. Um, as far as when you're going to be publishing a sensitive story. Yeah, that was my um, next question. On that instance, it's not just the government that comes to the press. It's the press goes to the government to, you know, they're Give them a, a heads up. It gives them a heads up asking questions for confirmation, et cetera, and a discussion then ensues. And it's ultimately up to the editors of the news organization to decide well, these seem, concerns seem valid. Should we retract certain aspects of it? Should we delay the uh, publication? Um, and uh, journalists like Mr. Risen have been made very uncomfortable by some of those decisions, and he wrote about it recently in, in, at the, in The Intercept. Um, is the journalist usually in those conversations, or is it usually counsel editors? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it varies. Um, but, you know, there's certainly discussion with the journalists. Um, but the, you know, final call will be made by the editor um, and conceivably the publisher. I have to imagine that the news institutions in those cases have most of the leverage. Does the government ever try and issue a prior restraint or do they realize at this point that that's a lost cause both in the courts and in the court of public opinion? Well, um, obviously uh, President Nixon did try yeah. and he lost in the Pentagon Papers case made, you know, the, the subject of the movie The Post. Um, and since then, I do not see it very often. I mean, these days, the prior restraints come more from uh, in the cyberspace and cyberbullying uh, and laws revol revolving around that. And when should courts order takedowns of you know harassing um, uh, internet posts? I know of one case where someone. Um, it was a very seedy uh, sordid thing um, where... Uh, As a lot of First Amendment litigation is, <laughs> we work at the margins, of course. An associate was having an affair with a partner, and the wife of the partner found out and started posting extremely harassing things, and a court ordered her to stop. Um, and... Uh, it's more in that context that I'm seeing it these days, or I represented <clears throat> Yelp in a case where a lawyer didn't like a review that a client had posted on Yelp. He got an injunction ordering a takedown and a money damages without ever having actually served Yelp, and we were able to get that vacated, um, and the uh, injunction was never enforced. Um, the case was dismissed by the court um, under uh, Section 230 um, protection for websites that host third-party content. With 
Edward Snowden, I want to. I was just thinking back here about a whistleblower's question. Uh, do you think if he had came back to the United States and you know was prosecuted, potentially went to jail, that the Obama administration would have pardoned him in the same way they did with the general who you mentioned before? This is all speculation, of course. Um, I don't know. Um, it, it's possible. I mean, the same question could be applied to Julian Assange and yeah. the, the Wiki, WikiLeaks. Um, and, you know, certainly in the Snowden case, it resulted in reforms um, and uh, that I think were all to the good. And so uh, I think he... He would have definitely been prosecuted. He definitely would have been sentenced to some sentence um, because employees or general contractors or whatever do have obligations. Um, do I think the President Obama might have pardoned him? He might have. Yeah. I mentioned uh, very briefly in my conversation with Lee Levine anti slap laws. Uh, these are the acronym is strategic lawsuit against public participation, uh, and these, to my understanding, are pretty important laws in many states to news institutions. They protect themselves against frivolous litigation to try and shut up reporting. Um, do they apply also? And well, what, what what do you think of the importance of anti-slap statutes, and and do they also apply at the federal level? Well, I was the first to get the the D.C. anti-slap law to apply in federal court in D.C. It has since undergone um, a, a torturous path um, that uh, raises a lot of uh, very law schooly questions. Um, I think one case where I, I heard the D.C. Circuit say, this case, this gives me a headache, one of the judges <laughs> said. <laughs> There's no federal anti-slap statute, There's correct? not yet. Okay. Um, there is legislation afoot on that, um, but there isn't yet. Um, and uh, it, the the answer is it does apply in state courts. Um, in on the federal level, um, the D.C. Circuit in a case called Abbas versus Foreign Policy held that it didn't apply in federal court because the procedural provisions, which include uh, a stay of discovery, interlocutory appeal, and and uh, an expedited examination of the merits where you have to prove I mean, probability of success or likelihood of success. They said that was contrary to Rule 12 and Rule 56, Rule 12 being the rule on motions to dismiss and Rule 56 being the rule on summary judgment. Um, and, but the, what they said in a footnote was, uh, first of all, they said that the D.C.'s own highest court, the D.C. Court of Appeals, had not yet ruled on what the statute re required, and that if it had only been an attorney's fees law, because what happens under the SLAP law is if if you win as a defendant, you get your attorney's fees paid, and that is a critical provision that's really in probably the most important part of the SLAP law, um, and uh, that has been held by various courts to be substantive. And I will say the Ninth Circuit, the First Circuit, the Fifth Circuit all apply uh, slap laws. And the Second Circuit, uh, most recently, just Friday, I think, or Thursday, uh, in a case that Lee was involved in, uh, applied the Nevada slap law in federal court in New York and awarded Lee and his client uh, $2 million from Sheldon Adelson. Um, ah, Sheldon's in another one of these cases. He is. Um, and, <laughs> Making good First Amendment law one case at a time. <laughs> and $2 million yeah. is maybe uh, chump change to Mr. Adelson, but is real money to most. And the reason why the attorney's fees is so important is, first of all, it is very much a David and Goliath kind of law. And it is it allows you to discourage lawsuits to say, you know, if you bring this lawsuit, you might end up paying our attorney's fees. Or if you win the slap motion and, and you're eligible for attorney's fees, it can discourage appeal because you say, you know, if you will pursue attorney's fees, why don't you drop the appeal? So it has a very palliative effect in that regard. And, and the most recent example in my world uh, is a case, we're doing two cases uh, defending Greenpeace. 
uh, in connection with defamation and civil RICO. That's a racketeering law. Um, and uh, those cases, uh, one is brought by a timber company in Canada and another by an owner of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And uh, what makes the, the case so frightening is that civil RICO uh, is, uh, allows for treble damages. So, for example, in the Dakota Access Pipeline, they're asking for $900 million dollars against Greenpeace, you know. Uh, Enough uh, to put them out of business. Totally out of business. And RICO was, you know, designed for mobsters, basically. And uh, you have to show uh, criminal uh, predicate criminal acts. So in these cases, basically, it's all about what Greenpeace is saying about the forest company's forestry practices. Are they sustainable? Are they affecting the caribou up in the northernmost reaches of Canadian forest, um, and we argue that there, that's protected opinion, and that's advocacy, and that they couldn't show actual malice, and a federal judge in San Francisco agreed with us, and we also asked for the California slap law to apply, and he awarded us fees. He did also allow them to amend their complaint, so we are currently now moving to dismiss the amended complaint. Um, but uh, that's a, a perfect example of, you know, a big company going against a nonprofit. Um, that's where attorney's fees really matter um, and can have a very uh, speech protective uh, 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 speech protective effect. Now, in the D.C. landscape, after the D.C. Circuit said that it did not, the D.C. slap law did not apply in federal court, the D.C. Court of Appeals, which is D.C.'s highest court, local court, yeah. said, you know, no, we interpret the statute to be doing nothing more than uh, the federal rules do by way of motions to dismiss and summary judgment. It only basically adds uh, uh, attorney's fees. So we have moved in another case in a federal district court here to apply the D.C. slap law in light of the subsequent uh, Court of Appeals decision that should resolve some of the concerns that the D.C. Circuit had when they decided not to apply the D.C. slap law in federal court. Do most states have anti-slap laws at this point? Many do. Uh, many, I mean, the slap laws vary. Surprisingly, New York's, which, you know, New York is a you know, Media capital one of, of the world. Correct. Has a, a very pathetic slap law. Um, we just tried to raise it in a case. It's very narrow. It only allows you uh, to raise slap when it's commenting on applications for licensing and permits and things. And so we represented ProPublica, our journalists at ProPublica, who wrote a very long, important story about the largest uh, nursing home chain in New York um, and cited... Uh, various uh, um, deficiencies that have been found by the government and linked to all the government reports and press releases and various uh, actions Public involving information. criminal charges against yeah. some of the uh, employees. And we sought to apply the New York slap law because what the story was about is that notwithstanding all these violations, the chain kept on getting these certificates of need where they could expand or change ownership, acquire new nursing homes. So we were very much commenting on the licensing uh, process and uh, that they oh, yeah, were yeah. proceeding with. We won on uh, uh, both on, uh, on the grounds that we were reporting on official proceedings and that we were and that they had not demonstrated uh, or pled actual malice sufficiently. Uh, but the judge said, since I've done that, I don't need to address whether the slap law applies because I would not award attorney's fees because you have to show basically that the plaintiff's position was without any basis, substantial basis in law or fact, basically frivolous. So uh, the, but the a nursing home chain has both appealed and moved for reconsideration on, on they had 13 
claims and uh, on two of them. So we may get a second chance to raise the slap again. Yeah. Um, uh, do you see some of these strategic lawsuits against public participation declining with the advent of these anti-slap laws? Or is, are these still very much the concerns of uh, news institutions? Um, well, I I see, you know, I think libel laws and libel cases are up and in in those jurisdictions that have strong sla anti-slap laws such as California um, you know these you know, these laws are ap applied to good Does effect. Does California have the strongest one in your yes, opinion? Yes, yeah. I would say or it's certainly been the one that's been around one of the longest and applied most often and and the Ninth Circuit recently refused to rehear the question of whether it applied in federal court um uh, Judge Kaczynski had led the charge to have that revisited, and uh, they declined to do that. Um, so I, I think, and when you see the prevalence of suits like RICO, um, although the SLAP, in, interestingly, in the RICO case, the defamation RICO, SLAP only applies to state law claims. So to the extent we got attorney's fees in that case, it uh, only applied to the defamation claims. It wouldn't apply to the RICO claims, which are federal claims, even though we claimed, and I think correctly, that the RICO claims were just defamation claims in disguise and not really uh, stating criminal but Presumably acts. a federal anti-SLAP statute would encompass RICO claims yes, as well. Would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with book publishers at all? Yes, well, the case in which I represented Jim Risen was for his book, Pay Any Price. Ah, yeah. Uh, published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, are, are book publishers' concerns, uh, pre-publications concerns, similar to the pre-publications concerns of, of other news outlets? Um, I'm thinking right now about a lot of the concerns that book publishers have with seeming growing sensitivity among readers. They're, they're now implementing not just attorneys to review books before they go out, but also these, quote, sensitivity readers to review books before they go out. I had not seen that. Um, and, um, you know, books are... It's not a legal question, of yeah. course, but... I mean, books are a little bit different in that, you know, it's often a... F sometimes a first-person account, you know, a memoir or something. You don't always have to go and get comment from both sides the way you would in a news article. Um, it's more from a perspective of the author. So it, it is a little bit different in that way. Um, and, of course, in the national security realm, if the author is a former government employee, he has to go submit his manuscript to the government for clearance. Uh, of national security concerns. Or, so um, presumably Comey and his publisher had to take their book I would to a lot of lawyers <laughs> and to the government. And to the government. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, in general, the government has not used that as a device to suppress speech that they don't like. That's at least been the history, um, I would say, of that. Um, and on, I have not seen these sensitivity concerns. I mean, obviously, when authors who are about to be published have um, get, you know, publicly reviled for yeah, Various being reasons. insensitive, yeah. Um, or Me Too or whatever, uh -huh. th that can affect publishing decisions because is the book going to be able to sell? Yeah. This is my last question for you. What are council's offices in, in news institutions most worried about today? Has there been any change in the last 20 years about what the concerns are? Are they still national security? Are they still, you know, having their reporters being subpoenaed? What, what are the big concerns these days? What are people coming to you with? Well, I think all of what you describe is there. I mean, with the advent of the internet and the advent of electronic communications, you know, the ability to see the discourse, um, you know, and subpoena the discourse and have it, you know, revealed in discovery. Obviously, 
one has to be thoughtful about what you put in an email. Um, not we lawyers, but you know, journalists talking to each other. Probably better to not put your email to a source in Gmail, right? Correct. <laughs> Have it be at NewYorkTimes.com. Correct. So you know, those kinds of considerations, I think, are sort of, you know, been around now for at least a decade, but that's certainly a part of it. And uh, the ability, you know, and therefore subpoenas to journalists are very much a part of the, con you know, the concerns that go into things. Um, and, you know, confidential sources, there have always been confidential sources. What happens if you were to get sued and you relied on a confidential source? That's always been an issue, um, you know, because you're not going to reveal the source, but then are you going to be able to say, well, I was told, I can't tell you by who, X, Y, Z, and, you know, what other corroboration do you have that you would be able to share? Um, that's certainly been very much a part always of the calculation and now so continues to be. Um, and, um, you know, in the Me Too era, we've obviously also been dealing with a lot of those stories um, and trying to corroborate as much as we can in, in those contexts. I imagine well. there's a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes there as well to avoid a defamation claim. Yeah, I mean, there's no avoiding defamation. The question is, what can you do to make the claim the most defensible possible and to be able to get it out as early as possible? Um, you know, and so, you know, the most obvious example is the one I mentioned about linking to official reports. If you can say, according to the lawsuit filed yesterday, uh, the allegations are, and they might be, you know, incredible allegations that you have no basis of knowing whether they're true or false, but if they're in a lawsuit, and as long as you attribute it to the lawsuit, and if you can link to the lawsuit, then it's going to be protected, uh, and you'll get out on a motion to dismiss by showing, yeah, I just was reporting on what was in the lawsuit. Um, and so looking for ways to make it uh, as you know, viable as possible without you're not going to eliminate the possibility that someone's going to bring a claim. Well, I think we're just at an hour. I asked for an hour of your time. This has been incredibly fascinating, and I thank you for speaking with me today. You're welcome. That was Davis Wright Tremaine attorney Laura Hanman. You can learn more about her work at dwt.com slash people slash Laura R. Handman. And while you're out there on the internet and learning more things about more people, please learn more about our May 8th campus free speech crisis debate at the Comedy Cellar. As I said, Andrew Sullivan of New York Magazine will participate. Jonathan Haidt of Heterodox Academy will have Penn America CEO Suzanne Nozzle and Acadia University scholar Jeffrey Sachs all participating. And I'm hoping that this is the definitive debate on the campus free speech crisis. Tickets are now on sale. And if you're in town, please come hang out with me and hang out with 175 of your closest free speech friends. But get your tickets soon because uh, they are selling fast. This podcast is hosted and produced and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast or follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk. You can also email us if you have feedback or questions. Uh, our email address is so to speak at the fire.org. And we also have a voicemail inbox in case you want to call in questions for a future show that we might play on an episode or present to a guest in the future. That call-in number is 215-315-0100. If you're afraid of talking to people, don't worry. You don't have to talk to people when you call into that number. It goes straight to voicemail. If you enjoyed this episode, as always, I ask you every week, consider leaving us a review on iTunes. Reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thank you again for listening. And don't forget, buy your tickets to our May 8th debate at the Comedy Cellar in New York City. You won't want to miss it.